I propose we start. I am actually the moderator of today's webinar in this series of Community of Practice hosted by the HEAL project. Uh, usually, uh, Ilri gives this uh, presentation, but here one more uh, cannot unfortunately be with us uh, today. Thus, I, I rep represent uh, Veterinaires Sans Frontières Suisse, uh, actually the lead agency of this very exciting uh, long-term uh, program uh, we have uh, with HEAL. Just very briefly about HEAL. So I believe this is one of the few larger programs that takes One Health mm -hmm. from, from the communities to local authorities to national uh, policies, huh? really testing so many of these theories uh, and hypotheses uh, we have uh, put out in, in using more synergies between health service uh, provision and, and health services is animal, human and environmental health. And we are currently discussing a lot about our indicators in here huh, that we, we have sector wide indicators, a lot very detailed indicators but we still somehow lack good indicators on how to capture this added value huh, of, of these one health units we are, we are setting up. Um, and of course, costs will play uh, important roles here. Thus, I am very, very pleased huh, to welcome today uh, our speaker, Leon Thomas, um, who will talk about the economics. Huh? The, in the end, uh, we talk about money huh? and costs. Um, so Lian is a joint appointment scientist with the University of Liverpool and Ilri in Nairobi. And she currently leads the uh, theme on neglected tropical diseases huh? within the Oreca does the, the One Health Research, Education and Outreach Center in Africa platform that is funded by, by BMZ. And I do not want to take any more time from Liam. Does Liam, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Esther. Great to see um, so many people I know here today. Thanks for coming. Um, so while I just set up my screen, I will start with a confession, which is um, that I am not an economist. Um, so I am going to talk to you today um, as a vet and, and sort of self-styled um, One Health practitioner um, about some of the economic concepts um, that I've been lucky enough to pick up um, from my time um, working alongside uh, Jonathan Rushton, who I'm, uh, m many of you will know. Um, and so today is sort of filtered through my lens, what I think we need to know as One Health practitioners, um, just a few key concepts that, that would be useful for us. Now, can I just ask um, uh, Esther, can you see my note slide or my slideshow? Because it always seems to, to get the wrong way around. The notes. And now? Now is good. Wonderful. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to just start with my acknowledgements, and that is um, to, to all those people that I've been working with, as I've mentioned, particularly um, Jonathan Rushton, who's been a, a mentor, his team at Liverpool and the wider GBADS consortia, as well as my colleagues here at, at ILRI and my, my current and, and recent funders. So thank you to them all. So we, I'm just going to uh, look at today um, a little bit about what is economics? Why should we care about it? Um, how economic data is used in, in setting agendas? Um, and, and then evaluating our health interventions. And then um, some thoughts about as we move towards um, a, a One Health economics. Um, so let's see if this works. 
Oh, no. Okay. I was saying to Saba that I had got a mentee set up um, to engage everybody, but I am not going to attempt to re-log in because this should have been the slide. So I apologize for my technical ineptness and we will just move on. If, if I can move on. Okay, let me restart from the next slide. Unfortunately, just before everybody joined, I made an impromptu um, disappearance uh, due to a, a blue screen of, of death on my computer. So I'm not gonna tempt fate by trying to um, push it into anything it doesn't want to do. <laughs> okay. So I was going to ask you all to tell me what, what words came to mind when you think about economics. And Esther had already said money, and money was probably going to come out um, very, very strongly in the wonderful word cloud that didn't happen. Um, but essentially, economics, it's not, it's not just about money, but it is about resources and our use of resources. Um, so resources could be money, it could be manpower, it could be um, grazing, um, uh, acreage, water. So all of those are our resources, which are scarce. And we need to make decisions about how to best utilize those resources. Um, so we can use economics to, to help us answer questions about, you know, how do we achieve a certain result most efficiently? Um, or we've got you know, a certain budget, what's the best thing we can do? We're really searching for an optimal um, use of those, those resources. And underlying a, a lot of sort of economic principles are, is this assumption that us as humans are rational utility maximizers. Um, basically that we are going to make sensible decisions um, in our own best interest to maximize the utility we get out of our resources. And that utility could be um, our own happiness, our, uh, our state of nutrition, our bank accounts, um, everything that we, we're going to strive towards this, this maximum. I think, you know, it's possibly over-egging how good we are at making rational choices. Um, I, for one, certainly know that it's probably not in my best interest to eat that chocolate bar, but um, maybe in terms of my happiness at the moment, that makes the best, uh, best decision. But regardless of our, our ability to live up to this um, hype, on a systems level, it's, um, it's a pretty good guide about the way that we make decisions. You know, whether we're individuals, households, businesses or nations, we are all working under finite resources and we really need to make the, the, the best of, of this situation. Um, and so and another sort of key concept we have to consider is that of opportunity costs. So what else could have been done with that resource? Um, you know, if we're going to go and spend lots of money vaccinating pigs for my pet, uh, pet disease, tenia solium, we can't necessarily use it for bed nets for malaria. We need to to consider that, constantly consider that trade-off. And so why should we care as One Health practitioners? Well, exactly that. We, we, are, we have um, a belief that we should consider um, animals, humans, and the environment and optimizing the health of all three. And we have certain interventions that we think can help us achieve that goal. But those interventions and programs are competing against many, many different um, competing objectives. And so we need to, to consider utilizing economic data to help us talk to decision makers, particularly you know, those people who hold the purse strings, to be able to, to allow us to move forward our, um, uh, you know, our, our interventions. But I would also consider that as One Health practitioners, we do have an inherent interest in the big picture. And although we may have our pet problems, I mean, I've, I've just mentioned cystic psychosis. Those of you who know me will know that I cannot um, go through a conversation without mentioning it. But if I step back objectively, although that is something of interest, 
as a as someone who's interested in one health i do want us to make the the right decisions at a societal level so although we're not a, immune for bi from bias we should be considering what is the optimal state for all of our stakeholders um and so economic data as i mentioned can be used to the to, to drive our decision making and can be used to, to help present um, our, uh, our data to, to decision makers. And we need to start by setting an agenda using knowing what the current state of play is. So that's we can look at this as sort of a baseline or or just a, a yeah. What is, what is our current state of play? And so you would be very familiar with this um, agenda setting uh, role for data. I'm sure mo many of you have started um, presentations or manuscripts with X many people die from a disease or X disease costs farmers this many million pounds. You know, all of these are setting an agenda, setting a baseline. Of course, single figures are not necessarily particularly useful on their own unless you are comparing them to others. But, um, and they can be used rationally. So in comparison, searching for optimality, or they can be used irrationally. So putting figures out there, which are, are, are really sort of advocating, but don't relate the problem to other, other issues. Now, within the three domains of One Health, human health is probably the most sophisticated in terms of its use of economic data um, and its ability to set agendas, set baselines and undertake economic analysis. So you may, might have heard people talking about metrics, which are essentially just quantifiable units which describe the um, uh, describe the, the burden of a disease. Um, and uh, earlier I'd mentioned utility. So a burden could be um, thought of as a disutility. It's reducing the utility we get out of, out of the world. So let's have a think about some metrics that we can, that are used in human health. And so we have um, monetary and non-monetary metrics. And so I'll, I'll start by running through these, these non-monetary metrics. Um, and one that you are probably all very familiar with at the moment, because we are seeing it every day, are uh, our mortality figures, death rates. We're getting bombarded with, with this sort of data. And um, so here are our current sort of COVID, COVID figures. Um, and this is data um, from 2019, so not including COVID, of um, you know of the the number of deaths. This was actually Kenya that I that I selected off the um, Global Burden of Disease um, website, and showing the 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 causes of death and the numbers of death across the world. But um, and actually, if we we look here, we can see but deaths might be a little bit difficult to compare. So we've got here um, stroke and neonatal um, deaths, and each of those were responsible for approximately 6% of the, the burden of disease as measured by deaths in Kenya in 2019. But can we state equivalence of those? Um, I mean, that's a question of value, and, and there's many people, there's no right or wrong answer. Many people would say, yes, a life is a life. Those are completely equivalent. But if we're considering this sort of underlying um, concept of utility, we might want to probe a little bit more, uh, a little bit deeper and have a little bit more nuance um, and consider how much utility is lost through each of those problems. And so one way of doing that would be consider potentially the number of years of life lost through each of those problems. And that would mean we'd need to consider the populations which are suffering from those two issues. And so this sort of, this is, uh, takes us towards um, utilizing life expectancies and, and trying to find out the years of life lost. And so um, across a population, we, we could just say, um, there is a standard life expectancy as seen at, at birth, and we can consider the, the difference between the age that people die and that standard life expectancy. Or we can use these life tables um, to understand at 
age X, what would be the expected um, life um, onwards? And, and this sort of reflects, if we look at this, which is possibly a little bit small for you, but if we look at um, the expectation of life lived after the, if somebody is less than one year old, we can see that it actually gets a little bit higher after that one year barrier. Now this is in Kenya and it's reflecting here that slightly increased um, risk of mortality for that cohort of under ones. And then, you know, and then it sort of continues as you would expect that as somebody gets older, the, the years of life that they're expected to live reduces. But if we can go back to the previous um, uh, consideration of, of comparing um, stroke and uh, neonatal um, diarrheas, a, um, a death of an infant um, could result in, in 66 years of life loss, whereas death from a stroke at the age of 60 would result in, in about 17, just over 17 and a half years lost in, with the Kenya data. So we've started to bring in a little bit more um, detail here on at a population level, um, what is the burden in terms of, of years of life lost? But we can go a little bit further, add a little bit more nuance, nuance. So what about if those years of life were lived with an ongoing impairment or disability? And this is where um, the combined metrics, and you will be probably familiar with, with these of the, the quality, the quality adjusted life year and the DALI, the disability adjusted life year, come in, where we can take the um, a combination of both the years of life um, that could be lost and the um, potential reduction in, in utility because of um, a disease or in, in impairment. Um, and the, these two um, DALIs are, are used uh, very, um, very much across sort of global health. Um, qualies are, are used very regularly, um, especially in the UK, where I'm from, they're used by our national health service to, to make decisions. And uh, they're not quite the converse of each other, but a quality, if you think of, is a, a good that you want to maximize, and a dally is a bad that you want to minimize. Um, so the dally is something that we may use a, a lot. So we'll just run through a little bit how that, that is formed. And as I mentioned, it's a combination of the years of life lo lost and the years of life lived with a disability. Um, and so we've already talked about how the, the years of life lost is calculated. The, year, the years lived with a disability is where we have the onset age of onset and the potential um, years lived with that. And, and it's uh, times by disability weight, um, where zero is um, uh, full health and one is death. And the disability um, weighting is um, possibly one of the, the most um, contentious aspects of DALIs because it is inherently subjective. Um, they, the, the ways that the disability weightings have um, been calculated have changed through the, the evolution of, of the DALI as a metric. Um, at the moment, they're sort of used, there's been expert elicitations, there's been, um, uh, sort of person trade-offs. It, it, it's a it's quite a, a contentious issue, but um, and at the moment, some, several different estimates do exist for for some disease states or or what people would think would be equivalent disease states. But it's it's really sort of um, in terms of um, trying to capture these um, uh, the the impacts of disease on on people. This this is really one of the most sophisticated we have. Um, and now I'm going to see if I can skip past the, the next uh, mentee without it freezing. No, I'm really sorry about this, everybody. This serves me right for being trying to be technical when I'm not. So one moment. Um. Leanne? I, I have yes. the I have the main two questions on my computer. Do you want me to share it from my end? Um, I would say yes, but I'm really worried now that after my computer crash that if I try and get into 
the website to watch it come up, it will um, it'll really disrupt. So I think I might have to just um, just admit defeat on this. And sure. I'm so sorry, everybody. So sorry. Right. I've now skipped. So let me go back. Um, and can we use the chat maybe to leave comments? Yes, that's a great idea, Alex. So um, uh, especially at the end, I'll leave this. It was really just a. I was going to ask you to wake up by ranking some um, some diseases by by dallies, um, but I've now given everybody the uh, <laughs> the answers. So. <laughs> Um, but at the end, I've got some questions that I would love everyone to engage with. So I'll. Um... Um... You're still on the okay. notes. Yep. yep, I'm just swapping. Perfect. Oh dear. Right. Okay. Let's get back to it. Um, <laughs> so, um, as I said, I was I was just going to ask everybody to to rank some diseases. Um, and it was also a reminder to me because I had included um, tenius oleum cystosicosis, which is down here in this tiny little square here. And is always a good wake up call to remember how, um, how many other very um, serious burdens there are in the world, um, which is good when you get very obsessed with your own little area of science. Um, so, I realized that I had skipped over a little bit of background on the DALI. Um, and essentially this was um, a metric that um, sort of was born in, in the, the 90s um, in, as part of the Global Burden of Disease um, study, which was originally set up, um, I think funded by the, the World Bank and, and, and led by uh, the WHO. It, um, has evolved and grown up and, and since flown the nest. And there is now the um, uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is an independent body running, um, running this, uh, this huge um, global and an annual um, estimate of um, burden. And um, this study now provides um, these DALI estimates for um, 369 diseases in, and injuries um, and an additional 87 risk factors across 204 countries and territories. Um, it is a huge study and it's systematic and it's, and it's producing these yearly annual estimates. Um, and you can, um, the data can be disaggregated to sort of subnational level. You can look at trends over time. They have a, a whole section on um, understanding investment in, in human health services. Um, so here we've got um, uh, an illustration of the, the disease burden in Kenya um, between uh, 1990 and uh, 2019. Um, and you can see here the sort of the increased relevance of, of uh, non-communicable diseases um, in the disease burden. And if you want to go and have some fun, go to their, their website, the, the, um, uh, the link is here and have a play with this. Um, though, of course, you know, I shouldn't probably admit what, to what I find as being fun. Anyway, the DALI um, as, a, as a metric is, um, it is, is very comprehensive, but it doesn't incorporate all of the burden of, of health. And so a large part of this burden is also the economic costs of a disease and our response to those diseases. And this is where um, uh, studies such as the a cost of illness study come in. And you can see the, here from, from a, a paper on, um, on the concept of cost of illness studies, we, we can break these costs into the direct healthcare costs and um, the direct non-healthcare costs of a, of a disease, but also the indirect costs. And I'd mentioned earlier aspects of um, opportunity costs that we need to consider. So this has productivity losses through morbidity and mortality, but also um, time spent by caregivers in, in taking people to, to seek healthcare or to being with, the, with people who are ill. So we have this additional burden that is not at, at, at yet as yet 
captured in, in a, a DALI. Um, so this was moving to the, the, the sort of monetary values. And then we have another, the last concept I'd like to bring up from human health is um, the quantification of health burden in terms of monetary value. And historically, we have been quite squeamish about placing monetary values on life. And of course, again, you know, how do you value a life? It, most people will say that it is priceless. And yet to make decisions about healthcare and, um, and safety and, and things, we, we end up having to do this because we have to make a decision on, on what is worth an investment. And so in the, the 60s, a, um, an economist called Thomas Schelling suggested that, yes, we can't value life, but you can find out how much money people may be willing to pay to avoid a risk or willing to accept as compensation to take on a bit of a risk. So um, you could have an example um, of somebody doing an inherently risky risky job that who's paid a, a, an inflated salary or somebody willing to spend money on putting airbags into their, their cars to avoid a, a fatality. Um, here in Kenya, I always think about, you know, are we demonstrating our, our value of life if you're willing to pay more to go on a easy coach to Nakuru versus getting on a Matatu. Um, and so from, from this concept, we actually now have, we, we have valuations for um, a, a life called the value of, of a statistical life. And then if you actually sort of pro rata that uh, across a lifetime, we have a value for a statistical life year, which people have um, suggested as being a potential proxy value for a DALI. Um, there's been much less work done on, on this in, in sub-Saharan Africa than there has um, in Europe and the States. Um, one study which, which was a, a sort of um, like a stated preference rather than a, a revealed uh, preference study um, suggest, from Tanzania suggested that um, uh, people were willing uh, to pay um, approximately uh, $190 for um, a 2% reduction in fatality risk over a year. Um, and for some reason, I can't see my figures at the moment, so I won't try and um, pretend to remember the, the figure that they gave, but they estimated that um, a, a, va a value for statistical life year in Tanzania was worth approximately four and a half times GDP per capita which is uh, something to bear in mind when we come to evaluating interventions shortly. So we have baselines, um, our agenda setting or our baselines, but that's only the first step in, in making a, an investment decision. We also need to, um, being able to, to invest in prevention, control or treatment of a, of a health issue also requires the availability of of, effect, uh, of effective and acceptable technology and the knowledge of the economic efficiency of that technology through um, economic uh, evaluation, both in the sort of pre-rollout, so ex-ante modeling, and in the post-rollout um, uh, arenas. So three um, uh, economic sort of evaluation techniques that are worth being aware of is, is sort of from the very most basic sort of cost minimization analysis where we're, we're assuming that consequence is equivalent, but we're going to rank our interventions on cost alone. A cost benefit analysis, which where we use monetary units. So in this case, um, you know, if we were thinking about human health, we, we would have to use um, the, the value for statistical life or another monetary equivalent to determine the cost and the benefit of an intervention. Um, and that will, will give us um, uh, our sort of cost, uh, cost benefit uh, ratios or our internal uh, rate of return on our investment. Um, and most often utilized within in health economics is the, the cost effectiveness or the cost utility analysis, where we're finding the most appropriate non-monetary unit um, by which to measure our um, effectiveness. So, dollars per DALI averted or dollars per quali gained. Um, and we're comparing to um, 
an alternative course of action or we're comparing to, to our status quo and what would our incremental cost effectiveness be of, of uh, um, investing in additional measures. So I'd like to give you a, an example of where this is, has been used um, just to sort of give that, that whole cycle. This is rotavirus vaccination in, in Malawi. I'm feeling very bad for Brian Perry, who I know has at least once sat through this presentation, so I'm very sorry. Um, and we start with our agenda setting. Rotavirus was a major cause of, of under fives mortality, so we, we had a, a sort of death rate here as, a, as an agenda setting baseline, but we also had the um, availability of a safe and effective um, technology in terms of a, a vaccine which was pre-qualified by the WHO. So this pre-qualification means that WHO has, has identified a vaccine that meets its standards for quality, safety, efficacy, and it's suitable for the target population um, when combined with the other vaccines that are being rolled out. We also, and the, they also in this case, had the presence of a co-funding, co-financing mechanism through Gavi, the Vaccine Allowance uh, Alliance, <laughs> which would facilitate the uptake of such a, a vaccine. And ex-ante modeling suggested that it was very cost-effective. Um, so Malawi was, was eligible for this co-financing. The, the modeling said, yes, this looks like it, it should go ahead. So during a rollout, very good economic data was, was gathered. So we have um, data on the DALIs averted based on the, the incidence of, of rotavirus and the efficacy of the, the vaccine. We had cost of illness data um, from both the, the household, the individuals and the households and the um, health facilities and, and the um, health systems. And this was brought together into a um, standardized model, which is available for vaccines, the TriVac uh, model, and um, modeled over a 20-year period, um, showing the, the sort of reduction in the co-financing. And this, um, this modeling that used real world word data actually um, uh, indicated that um, we had, the, at a societal level, the cost effectiveness of this vaccine was going to be $10 per DALI averted. Um, but once we've got that data, we still need to be able to translate it into um, sort of what does that mean? Does that what does ten dollars per dali averted mean? How do you translate it into into policy? And so the great thing from this example is it it demonstrates all the things that we need to to take this in in motion. The um, uh, the agenda setting was was supported by sort of standardized metrics that people understood the available ability of a technology um, and the the ex ante modeling. We had these yeah standardized metrics models and thresholds for cost effectiveness that allow us to make that decision the who choice um, which is uh, choosing interventions which are cost effective they have um, thresholds which indicate that um, the dollars per dali averted um, should be less than three times the GDP per capita to be accepted as cost effective. And if they're less than once the GDP per capita, they're assumed to be highly cost effective. So in the rotavirus case, we said it was $10 per DALI averted. Malawi has a GDP per capita of $253. So this was considered a highly effective, uh, cost effective vaccine. Um, and you can see here that there are other um, standardized cost effectiveness thresholds elsewhere. So I mentioned the, the UK, we have the National Institute um, for Clinical Excellence, um, which suggests that there should, uh, uh, that um, uh, healthcare technology should come in at, at 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality gained. The USA has a sort of um, accepted um, threshold of around 50,000. Um, and so we note that previously I've mentioned that we can be a bit squeamish about putting monetary values on, on health, but even if we use a no, non-monetary metric, eventually we end up comparing to a, a monetary threshold. So these, these decisions and, and these sort of value judgments are always um, implicit within our economic uh, modelling. 
And of course, you know, there are ethical considerations. Using GDP per capita, it indicates that it's relevant to, to countries' ability to pay, but it, does it really reflect the underlying value? Uh, is a life worth less because people are in a, in a lower income country? Of course, these are, are big moral questions that um, always need considering. So this was examples from, from health economics as a, as a very sort of sophisticated and well-developed arena. So how do we move forward to one health economics? So if we're um, considering zoonoses as a, as a sort of key flagship for, for One Health, we need to, um, of course, consider what uh, Alex Shaw has, has just previously described as the double whammy of zoonoses. Um, and maybe we should actually even be moving up to sort of a triple whammy um, instead, and we start in incorporating better the environmental impact. So we're, we need to, to set baselines, to evaluate interventions. We need to move beyond just the human health impact. So I've uh, taken some, some slides from my, um, my colleague and mentor, Jonathan Rushton, and this sort of just nicely indicates that in the same way in, in humans, um, we have uh, uh, the sort of direct losses through the disease, the direct disease burden. We've also got the burden of disease from our reaction to that disease and our response to that disease. Um, and within animal health, we are generally measuring burden within mon monetary terms. Um, we consider considering the position of our livestock within the private sector, we can use gross margin or, or profits or losses of a farm enterprise to as our baseline state where we are without an intervention. Again, single disease estimates of, of burden do exist. There's been a lot of work on burden of disease, but as yet there haven't been standardized estimates of burdens for different diseases across different geographical areas. And this is where the, the global burden of animal diseases study is stepping in. So initiated by Professor Rushton, funded by um, Bill and Melinda Gates, the GBADS consortia is, is a, a wide group of, of people. ILRI is also a, a partner, which is gonna fill the, the paucity of economic data on, on animal diseases um, through the regular systematic collection, validation, analysis and dissemination of, um, of this data. And indicated here are the, the various steps through, this, through which um, these disease burdens will be obtained, which very much include a, a strong look at the underlying livestock population structure, um, developing a, an animal health loss envelope, which actually is a, a, a different concept than much of the burden work that's gone on before, because it actually limits, it, it sets a optimal, a utopia, and then considers what our losses are with that, um, that uh, top limitation. Attributing that, that health loss envelope um, by, by disease syndrome and, and accidents, and then looking at the impact on that in the wider economy. And through the GBADS program, they will be identifying where animal health investments are inadequate, where the investments are badly or poorly allocated and try and um, you know, really sort of set baselines for evaluation of, of future um, animal health um, interventions, including those for zoonoses. And please do go to their website to, to get more, more details. So when we're thinking about um, the estimates of, of burden of zoonoses and, and sort of better capturing sort of one health impacts, um, a, 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 a systematic literature review, which is currently ongoing by, um, by Jonathan and his team um, in, in Liverpool, commissioned by ORECA, has collected the, the current published data on um, zoonosis burden, where, where the animal and human um, health burden has been considered. And you can note here the, the relative paucity of this sort of data. And it's really worth noticing as well that not only are there a small number of studies, but the methodologies across these studies have been very different. And that makes it very difficult to sort of compare and actually start setting these, these standardized um, baselines for our different diseases. 
Um, so we really sort of need to gather momentum in this area, standardize our methodologies and, and have more studies if we're going to sort of start building the business case for One Health, utilizing our best data on, on animal health as well. So there have been um, uh, methods pr proposed in which we could bring together the burden of human health and the burden of animal health into one combined metric. And there are two um, uh, methodologies that I've been aware of to date. One is the zoonoses DALI, um, which is um, uh, bring, brings the, the economic losses in livestock, translates it to a, um, an animal loss equivalent, which would be you know, how many years of life would it take to, to um, earn or, or regain that loss? And that can be added onto a DALI. So you, here you're getting a non-monetary metric, um, which combines these two aspects. And alternatively, there is the option of using a monetary, met, net, monetary met, metric, <laughs> where um, rather than um, transforming the economic losses from livestock and into a into a DALI equivalent, we have the DALI transformed into an economic uh, metric. So this was using the value for statistical life year, and then adding that onto the the livestock losses to have one combined economic value. Um, so either of, of these metrics could be a great way of starting to to look at this combined um, uh, combined burden together, but underlying them the um, the data that goes in on on human health and animal health needs standardizing and and agreeing on and then a critical mass of uptake on on whichever uh, metric is decided so that that can be seen by decision makers as as the uh, as the metric of choice and of course we then mentioned the the potential for a triple whammy and and no, neither of these metrics currently has considered um, adopting um, uh, environmental losses. So everybody here would be well, well aware of the impact that, um, that uh, disease in, in livestock um, can have upon on, uh, the, uh, the ecosystem. So we can have death of wildlife, have poor productivity of our livestock leading to larger herds and rangeland degradation. We have condemnation of meat because of cystosarcosis sorry, um, leading that that essentially pushes up our, our carbon footprint per kilo of meat produced. All of these things could actually be um, start to, to be um, investigated and, and brought into um, the metrics that we're considering. So we have some key challenges to, to move One Health Economics forward and, and key top is probably the, the paucity of our burden data, particularly on, on zoonoses. The fact that it is difficult to quantify these in a single metric that means something to, to people. Um, we, of course, uh, have private sector actors where data streams may, may not be as available. We then have the issue of costs and benefits being accrued across different sectors. And uh, the the paper that, that people are most familiar with is the, the Roth paper from 2003 discussing brucellosis control in Mongolia. And that really demonstrated that should a cost sharing um, scenario be accepted, that from a human health point of view, the um, intervention of, of vaccinating cattle would be highly cost effective. And that from a societal point of view, we would get a high return on this investment. But the actual... Um, underlying institutions make it very difficult to, to get this cost sharing together. So we need to consider ways in which um, budgets can, can be shared or, or cross allocated, indicators which um, could allow for um, spending in, in one sector to be appropriately sort of um, earmarked. So I've been thinking a lot about our um, various targets under the Abuja um, declaration. Um, so you've got 15, an expectation that African countries are spending 15% of their um, public uh, expenditure on health. Now, are there ways in which that could, those targets could still be fulfilled if the, um, if the expenditure is sat in the veterinary sector vaccinating um, dogs for rabies, you know, do we need to have mechanisms where these can translate across so that we can actually start sharing costs according to where their benefits are accrued? We currently lack standardized models, 
thresholds for cost effectiveness. So if we do use a Z DALI, what then is a cost effective threshold for a Z DALI? Because it must be worth more than a DALI because it incorporates so much more. So we need to think about these things. We've got, you know, some really good ex ante evaluations. We need to con consider pushing forward to, to really good real world um, evaluations of our interventions um, and appropriate funding mechanisms, potentially catalytic, sort of catalytic investment that can get One Health off the ground. So um, my final thoughts, because I'm being very verbose, is that, yeah, we need, we need uh, to gain momentum. We need to get more people involved in this. We need our standardized um, approaches. You know, GBADS is doing a, is, is really sort of spearheading that. We need to include our environmental burden. We need to find frameworks in that in which we can incorporate that. And yeah, everyone just needs to get on board. So um, we'll share these slides. So here's some further reading for you. And my last slide was to be another mentee of, I want you guys, and you can put it in the chat, how will you incorporate economics into your work going forward? Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and pass the floor back to Esther. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Liana, for this very nice uh, talk, bringing us uh, to yeah, some, some more ground truth huh, on the effectiveness uh, of uh, One Health. But uh, in the end, yes, uh, I mean, you have opened really the box of, of Pandora, huh, and particularly looking at the participants uh, with us uh, today. Uh, the question is how to best invest uh, our scarce uh, resources to, to not maximize health. Huh? This, this is this quality concept, but to reduce burden of disease, thus this Dali concept. Now, the, the last question, if you can put it up, and I, I would say, let us take one, two minutes, so everybody can reply in the chat. Uh, his or her thoughts. Oh, thank uh, you. On it. Yes. So uh, let let us take uh, some time to to input our responses into the chat. And while you do, um, Esther, I see Brian has raised his hand. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, if I can, uh, first of all, thank you for a fantastic talk and a great overview of, uh, of economics uh, and of, of One Health and this very difficult of trying to bring uh, human and animal health uh, together under, under, under that umbrella with the measurement. Um, I, to be a little, you, I fully acknowledge this need for, uh, for valuation and the sort of overview evaluation, which is, uh, which is the, the DALI and, and all the things that you, you so well described. Uh, my, from the functionality point of view, though, in economics, I guess uh, something you mentioned earlier on, you said opportunity costs, but I, I rather referring them to, to trade-offs, is for interventions by different bodies, whether they are uh, national me medical public health services or private enterprises. So from the interventions point of view of, uh, which to me is the practicality way of, of doing it, rather than disease specific, which you uh, have focused on, but looking at broader health issues uh, under what services de delivering them, uh, how do you value this? What is the interaction between your overall costing and this decision making at more of a, of a national level or even of a local level of trying to, uh, to, to help decision makers in both public and private sectors in valuing uh, One Health issues. So um, apologies if I've not quite got you, Brian, so do step in. Um, so I'm assuming, and I'm sorry that, it, it, that maybe I did have and I admit I had a little bit too much sort of single disease focus here. So you're interested at a systems level. Um, 
so not necessarily looking at the burden of, of individual diseases, but how do we capture the benefits of, of sort of One Health working at a, a broader systems level? Um, and I think, you know, it's difficult. I think there's, um, of course, several sort of branches to that. One is, is um, whether our One Health interventions do have a, an impact on disease burden, whether that's at a sort of broader syndromic level or, or individually, and can we quantify that, that impact there? Or whether as a, you know, if we were considering One Health um, surveillance, do they have a quantifiable impact on improving timeliness or the sensitivity of that surveillance? It might not necessarily be or be very difficult to see the individual impact on, on burden of disease, but, but can we measure how bringing people together improves um, timeliness of response? Um, or even, um, and, and work by uh, Sarah Babo Martins sort of looked at this, or even do we consider the more intangible um, aspects? So building social capital, um, ensuring that people are, you know, do we push One Health from the fact that actually it allows people to um, know more, um, work in, in a more collaborative way, which is a, a sort of greater good than we can put a, 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 a quantity on. So I think there are, of course, different ways of valuing um, uh, our approaches um, from, a, from a systems level. But I think it is important if we can to, to try and get sort of empirical data on, on some of these values, because we need someone to invest at the end of the day. And we, we need to sort of show them some sort of return or some sort of benchmark for their in investment. So, so I, I think, you know, at the moment, trying to quantify some of these uh, um, impacts of um, our interventions on specific reducing disease burden or, or um, in economic terms helps in terms of talking to, to people and making our business case. But I'm really sorry if I've just completely digressed. So... <laughs> No, you've, you've done a great job. It was more looking at uh, uh, broader indicators, such as the SDGs and all the, um, the, the, the subsets of the SDGs that are involved uh, in, in which One Health features of how does one move towards the economic aspects of, of, of that within a, within a One Health context. If, if I may jump in here, I mean, before we jump to global uh, goals, uh, we first need to convince our national policy makers, right? And we, we, we do not know, and this also in, in view of, of long-term sustainable huh, interventions, huh, I think we, we at up to date, we still have a little grasp huh, what our local authorities, our communities need as, as indicators, our local authorities need and, and that and, and how we, how we should move this together huh, uh, to upper uh, agendas uh, because in the end the, the, our national uh, policy makers will need to to buy in huh? uh, yeah. and uh, it, it is here that uh, the yes yeah, the, the, there is this gap about this global uh, burden of disease global animal burden of disease, I, I must say, I, I was the global animal burden of disease. I, I was quite reassured when I have seen that the Alex Shaw is also involved in the network uh, because she was very critical in the past about this. Uh, but I mean, these interfaces, yes, on global level, this is one thing, but how do you create these, these good interfaces uh, that can be moved from one level uh, to, to the other. I don't want to I, abuse my role as moderator. No. I, I also see that uh, um, Paul Torgerson has his hand up. And perhaps uh, Paul will, will um, oh, it, 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 pick up uh, on what I, I have just said. Well, it, was just, uh, it was just a point about the cost effectiveness. Uh, Leanne suggested that if you had this joint metric for animal and the, the effects of diseases on the animal and human population, you would have to um, change the cost effective um, 
threshold. I'd actually say, no, you need to um, keep it the same because um, that's the point of having the, the, the additional metric to show that the additional effect on, uh, on the animal population um, can then be added to it to compete with the um, um, diseases that only have an effect on humans. So I don't think you should be thinking of changing the threshold if you have a, um, a, a joint metric. Okay. No, that that's that's great, Paul. And being that it's uh, that you developed it along with Alex and others, I am certainly not going to argue for that. So it's good to know. Okay, I thanks for for that intervention. I, that we Alex shouldn't has end. her hand up as well as, well as uh, Tom. Tom, I haven't seen you for so long, uh, but uh, he he put on his video, so I I. I, I give the floor to Tom first, and then Alex to compliment. Okay, thanks. I'll just make a very quick comment. I, th I think picking up on Brian's point, um, the, this uh, you focused on, and our literature focuses on the measurement of cost effectiveness for health uh, aspects, and that's because it's been led by veterinary and and human health sort of been pulled in, and so there's been a focus on that. But what part of what Brian was was talking about is that. Um, one health is having to also sell itself to other stakeholders, including the environment. And we don't have a metric that captures why it's important to them. All we can say is human health, human health, human health. So in the way that human health gave up on trying to put dollar amounts on, on human health uh, problems and, and went to the DALI, which was a brilliant, a brilliant move, um, something we'll have to be thinking about other innovative ways of trying to capture environment because again, environment is a bit like human health. You, people try to address it with willingness to pay for environmental services and things like that, but it still gets down very, uh, to be very problematic as well as animal welfare. Uh, and that, that begins to be, I mean, you're trying to address it now by adding it into the DALI. But um, yeah, we, we might need to be more explicit about that. Thanks. Yeah, Tom, I, I, Tom. I see you have your, your goose uh, golden eggs uh, in the back, Grant. Huh? I mean, that, that's really <laughs> Sorry uh, for that. the, 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 the question. Huh? How do we find this goose huh? laying these golden eggs? <laughs> yes. Before I hand the, the, the word to, to Alex, um, just to say, uh, I mean, here, for example, it's now really this long term 12 years uh, project, huh? including environmental health. We just had a, a recent workshop on, on saying, oh, we, we don't really know yet well how, how to capture uh, or integrate this uh, uh, um, envir environmental health. Huh? We, we are working on it. We are privileged that we have this long term perspective that this may be a playground, huh? also yeah. for, for others to jump in and test some of the hypothesis. Alex. Oh, thank you, Esther. Um, yeah, I like Tom's golden eggs too. I thought that was very, very, very opposite. Um, I, I just had two very minor things I wanted to contribute. Um, one was on the, the value of statistical life, which is not something I personally worked with. Um, Paul may have done, but it, it, it is even more subjective than using a DALI as linked to, to, to um, income, because it doesn't just vary with country, it varies in between groups. And, and, and the judgment of that, or, or if you like, the proof of that is that poor people do risky jobs. So poor people are forced to put a lower value on, you know, do, getting hurt or whatever. So, and, and that translates right across um, differences between countries and so on. So personally, I've not never been a fan of the VSL. Um, there's a writer called Laxminarian who's done some quite nice comparisons in different situations, if you, if you want to look up um, his stuff. Yeah, um, right. That's on the, the VSL. Um, the only other thing, because I think Esther slightly alluded to it and so on, and, and Jonathan may want to confirm that, is that within the global burden of animal diseases, we are not looking for an animal, um, an animal dally because it's just too complicated. I mean, in the US, 
every year millions of bovine life years are lost because um, people give them anti-helminthics and as a result they can be slaughtered at a young yeah. age yeah. so you very rapidly get into impossible no, contradictions anyway yeah. that was all thank you thank thanks Alex that's great no I think the the VSL I mean of course you know, whatever whatever sort of metric we're using, whether it's it's DALIs or, or or VSL, you know, all of this sort of we essentially have have problems in terms of subjectivity. But you know, I I, I always sort of think you know it's fine sort of pussyfooting around putting values on on life, but essentially, if we're continuing to use sort of cost effectiveness thresholds, we do the same thing, but at a later date. So uh, VSL may be lower in, in poor countries, um, and a DALI may feel more appropriate, but then we um, place it against a DALI against a, a cost effectiveness threshold that uh, implicitly, explicitly lowers the value of, of DALIs in certain countries. So I, I, I'm not... Um, as I'm, as I gave my uh, sort of initial apology, I'm, um, I'm coming at this as just things that I think are useful for us as One Health practitioners. But I, I certainly am not throwing my hat in with either camp. But I just think we, uh, we need to acknowledge that eventually we sort of always put some sort of value, um, and it's, yeah, unfortunate that the way that that sort of then reflects our, our disparate uh, socioeconomic statuses across the world. Esther, sorry. Uh, you're muted. Oh, Esther, you're muted. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I, I just caught in with my multiple windows. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I can. Ah, yes, here I'm back. Um, uh, yes, I think, you know, in future, we will need more of these, these analytical approaches huh? uh, and the, the, the global animal burden of disease. Uh, again, I think uh, I was very relieved to see Alex uh, on the things and she will challenge you uh, on this, uh, particularly on the interfaces. But sometimes, you know, I, I really believe, and that's why I changed from research to implementation. Huh? <laughs> we need to test these more these bottom up uh, hypotheses uh, we have. Huh? And these bottom up mm -hmm. hypo hypotheses are that the communities, they can very well state huh? what, what they want and, and need and we can bring it uh, to to a, a higher a higher level, but we do not we do we, we don't up to date we don't have sufficient uh, evidence huh, that this is sustainable um, because at, at one point we will be out huh? others will need to run mm. uh, the, the, the 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 so we don't have sufficient evidence on how to bring it to the next level and even to a higher level to make it more sustainable. Because we all, One Health practitioners, we all believe in it, uh, but how do we sustain uh, this permanent surveillance of diseases that is needed uh, uh, also to pick up uh, new health events? Uh, given uh, our scarce uh, resources, uh, and Yes, and I think yeah. these are really interesting questions. Uh, yeah. to address. Ab absolutely, Esther. I mean, I think this this is the ultimately the 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 thing is that um, you know we do believe that the interventions that we're doing are for the greater good, but we're never going to get sustain sustained intervention uh, those interventions sustained if they're not financed, and so that means learning to to speak the language. Now, as Brian and you picked up earlier that that might not just be sort of dollars or dallies, but understanding how things fit with with the the SGDs, uh, understanding the indicators, and just um, really learning to to find out what the priorities of different stakeholders are. So the communities have their priorities and and where they want to intervene. Local and national government and international organisations have their priorities and. 
And so, yes, we've got to get as much empirical evidence as we can, but also learn to understand how to talk to people about their other indicators and their other interests. Um, and and that's, that's a really ongoing process and something we could all get better at, um, myself certainly, certainly included. Um, Brian. Brian, <laughs> is, yes, his hand again. Yeah. And you will certainly pick up again on this private sector. I mean, the regions we are working with, the HEAL project, I mean, it's so astonishing to see how many private health providers are there and they face exactly the same problems as the governmental services. So perhaps of the, in addition with the, the problem is the absence of any governmental services doing quality control. So, uh, drugs uh, and so on, the, the main business plan. Huh? Brian, please, you, the word is um, yours. Uh, a, a brief note, apart from, again, to say what a great uh, talk. Thank you very much. The, the one thing that COVID has, has, has shown us is this uh, another indicator, which is the impact on health services. So this is it, the impact on health services. And so the, it's, not, it's, the, it's disease burden, but more on what those health services can stand and uh, in terms of preparedness, in terms of ability to, for surveillance, for, for disease X or disease Y, in terms of response of the human, uh, the, the emergency services, hospitalization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is, that to me, that context of, of interventions in, in burden on health services in a one health mm. context is, is, is interesting to consider. Yeah, certainly. You want to reply? I see the Tom and Delia. They have yes, I completely up. agree. That's really All the necks that disappeared <laughs> in the meantime. Just the, a little remark to, uh, to, to Brian's. Um, uh, into, no, no, let me, Tom and Celia, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I keep following Brian around, sort of the story of my life. But the, um, <laughs> the issue is to what degree the new money coming in because of COVID uh, is also going to put a demand for how do you target surveillance? I mean, talking about the longer term and sustainable type of, of One Health interventions. Where do you put your money for surveillance? And it's going to come back to some of exactly this kind of metrics to be able to justify where do you focus and, and is it individual diseases? Is it some kind of syndromic? Is it, you know, how, what, what approach? So there may be another, another um, page opening up on, on how this can be applied. Yes, uh, uh, or is it just an animal health? I mean, I, I am with Veterinaires of Frontier now. I'm very much lobbying animal health in its own rights. Huh? And we don't <laughs> need to put everything under the one health things. I mean, this, uh, it, it has so much to, to offer, but it's usually the other issues that are not so an OCD or get ne neglected. Huh? Yeah. No, and, and I think it's uh, I, I think it's a really important thing to to champion animal health in its own right. You know, as part like yes, it falls under. You know, it's important to improve our, our um, investment in in zoonosis surveillance and things, but that should be part and parcel of increasing our investment in in animal health services because essentially our our zoonosis surveillance is only going to be as good as its weakest link and if animal health services are chronically underfunded and unable to deal with the with the issues on the ground they're not going to be contributing to our fight against zoonosis either so yes certainly a champion for one uh, for investment in animal health um, certainly for all reasons and the same is true for, for health services huh? in the remote regions, they're also way, way weaker. Uh, Jonathan, please. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in that regard, um, we, we actually don't have any data on what's being spent on animal health. Um, so we, we don't know what's being spent in the private sector. We haven't documented what's being spent in the public sector. Um, we have data on what's being spent on pet health. Um, and that's being collected through the World Bank system of, of capturing those data, but we haven't actually managed to 
embed that and institutionalize that into animal health in a sort of livestock sense. So straight away, our data sets aren't adequate in terms of actually telling us anything about investment at either public sector level or private sector level across the economies. So I think, I think there are key things institutions like FAO, OIE and ILRI need to do to actually sort of combine and work with the World Bank to make sure that these things are actually sort of embedded in, into the future. Um, and I think, I think the other thing that I hope we start to address, I mean, Alex just alluded to it, but um, we are avoiding trying to produce an animal dally for the livestock side because livestock in general, the very term livestock indicates it's an economic activity, it's the investment in animals. Um, and therefore, turning that into a dally seems a nonsensical idea, given the fact that it is an economic activity. Um, in our investment strategies, it's, we use a different discount rate from the health system because it's seen as an economic activity. Um, so we are going to measure the burden of animal disease in livestock in monetary terms, not in terms mm. of looking at dally issues. And I think that's justifiable. Um, and, and, and Leon's also talked about the fact of the need to think beyond just a burden number, but also that balance between our reaction and expenditure versus a loss of production issues, which is, I think, a true use of economics in, in sort of moving that forward. So, I mean, there's lots of challenges that we're facing at the moment to sort of get that going. And Paul and Alex are taking part in all that discussion. Um, but it's really important we move towards more systematic analysis of the data that we currently have and better data sets so we can do better analysis about where we've got weaknesses across that system. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Can I just make a... You want to react, Liam? Uh, uh, Paul uh, put his hand yeah, up. I, I can only just <laughs> say I, I would have wished that you have would have chosen another term than burden of disease uh, because burden of disease the study is so much linked to uh, uh, the, the, the maximum lifespan of people which makes it puts it on this equitable basis uh, which is just not given in, in livestock. Paul? Yeah I just wanted to make a point about the animal dally. Um, I totally agree it's nonsense nonsensical to have an animal dally um, in the way it is done for human dallies, but it's also important not to confuse it with the Z dally con um, concept um, that we've proposed because the Z part of the Z dally is effectively a time trade-off um, to give the equivalent loss in um, in human life years, and it has nothing to do with the life expectancy of the animals. It's, it, it is um, the economic value of the animal that is then uh, put into a time trade-off. So it's not a, uh, the Z part of the Z dally is not really an animal dally um, in that sense of the word. And for, you know, doing these metrics, taking them further, I mean, the, we can't, we, the, the dally was, was um, proposed to deal with problems about the inequalities of the value of, shall we say, the statistical life between poor and rich countries. And then part of the DALI is the um, lives lived with disability, and that is effectively a time trade-off of non-fatal diseases or morbidity in terms of life lost. And that's where the Z DALI is the um, time trade-off in animal health losses. Um, and this could probably be taken to the next stage if one was thinking about environmental losses, um, also thinking in terms of a, a, a time trade-off type of approach. To say, I just wanted to make the point that the Z dally should not be confused with these um, animal dallies that have been suggested because it's not the same thing at all. Thank you for clarifying that, Paul. Um, I'm sorry if it wasn't as clear as that in my presentation, but thanks for the, the additional clarification. Leon, you have to find a word. Outlook. Outlook. Um, uh, well, we've had. You, uh, I've had you opened the box of the of Pandora. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think yeah. we've had some brilliant interventions here, which have given us even more things to do. So um, my um, my closing remark would be to encourage more and more people to um, get involved. <laughs>
<laughs> and try and help us, um, you know, solve these problems and, and, you know, whether it's on, you know, quantifying burden, whether it's on um, improving our evaluations of our interventions, whether it's more sort of qualitative social sciences to, to understand people's motivations and incentives and how we talk to decision makers. Can we get lots and lots of people to, you know, move across and get our students involved and get people involved in this? Because, I mean, I found it absolutely fascinating. This is not my background, but I've really enjoyed the last few years sort of getting more involved in economics and thinking about, you know, you, you have to sort of put on a systems thinking, approach, you know, hat and, and try and uh, to, to understand this. And it's, I mean, it's fascinating and it just opens doors and opens avenues that we need to explore. So, you know, let's get some of our students away from our prevalent studies and into this realm um, and start answering some of the questions that have been brought up today. So thank you. I mean, I feel so lucky that <laughs> of all the people that have intervened, we've got all the experts in the room. I've sort of opened up um, the floor and then we had all, all the experts come in and, and give their points. So I'm really grateful to everybody for, for coming. Um, and yeah, let's just keep this going and, and get involved. This is exciting stuff so thank you everyone and thanks esther and the hill project for inviting me today great final words so uh, we will close here the recordings will be available on the on the site thank you all for joining again it was such a pleasure to see former and, and current colleagues uh, pushing the one health agenda forward but taking it a bit more uh, from the ground. <laughs> Thank you all.